Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday Thought, I want to talk to you guys about the priesthood. There's a bit of confusion, I think, within the Latter-day Saint movement about how the priesthood... I don't know if I want to use the word works. Um, maybe we should use the way, the term, um, how it's laid out. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. So it's a little bit confusing when you look at it from a language perspective, because there's one priesthood, and that's the priesthood of God. And what is it? Is the priesthood a collection of people that focus on the teachings of the Lord and, and the things of God? Or is it the power of God? Well, I would say that it's both. Because you can be a member of the priesthood and you can hold the priesthood keys or priesthood power. Priesthood authority. I don't really like that term. But there's one priesthood. It's the priesthood of God, right? But then it gets divided up into two priesthoods. There's the higher and the lower. Uh, or the lower sometimes is called the Levitical priesthood. And I've even heard people recently say that the lower is divided between the Levitical, the people who are actual descendants of Levites, and then just the lower priesthood, which you can't really have unless you're an actual member, an actual Levite, and things like that, uh, which I'm not sure if I believe that or not. I, I personally don't like this idea that you have to be uh, a, you know, a lineage of a particular tribe or something in order to do certain things. I, I think that seems a bit elitist. And I don't think we fully understand the uh, the meaning in the scriptures behind these things, behind, behind that, that idea. I'll say it like that. Well, then now it's, we're going to do it even further. So let's say that it's two. We have the higher and the lower. Well, now you've got the male and the female, right? You've got, uh, for the low priesthood, you've got the Aaronic and the uh, Miriamic. And then for the Higher, you've got Melchizedek, and you've got Magdalene. So now suddenly we've got four priesthoods, but that's not enough. Wait, there's more. We also have the patriarchal priesthood. And so you have a patriarch and a matriarch. And now we get into this idea that are there, are there three priesthoods, six priesthoods? And, and then there's the hierarchy. There's this idea that you have to graduate from the low priesthood to the high priesthood. And there's people who think that the uh patriarchal priesthood, matriarchal priesthood, is higher even than the Melchizedek priesthood. And so there's, there's quite a bit of confusion here as to how all this works. And I think that the big problem stems from the fact that as human beings, we try to take our mundane concepts and we try to in, inject them into the Lord's perspective. Instead of trying to figure out the way the Lord sees things, and then change our worldview accordingly. I understand the way that I, the way that I see all this is that these priesthood titles, these priesthood roles, and, and, and yes, I know in some parts of the scriptures are even called degrees. I don't think that they are like. Uh, well, I remember when I was in, in Cub Scouts. You, you started off, you, you had no badges, and then you got like the wolf and the bobcat and the bear. And I think Weeblow was the last one. Um, and if I got the order wrong, and I apologize to anybody that's big on scouting. It's been a very long time since I was a Cub Scouts. Um, but the general idea was that as you learn and grew, you got a new badge. And I think there's a lot of people who see the priesthood the same way. I'm going to be a deacon first. And I've got, I've got my deacon badge, right? And now I'm going to become a teacher. I've got my teacher badge. Now I'm going to become a priest or priestess. I've got my priest to, Priest or priestess badge. Now I'm done with Cub Scouts. Time to move on to Boy Scouts or, or Girl Scouts. And so now we've got a whole new set of, of badges. And I, I just, I don't think that's the way that the Lord works. I don't think that there is a, a hierarchy the way that we see hierarchies in in our world, in our terminology. I don't think that in order to receive temple ordinances, you have to be ordained to the high priesthood. I, I don't think that makes any sense. Why would you be ordained to, or as a deacon or a teacher, we'll say, but you don't receive the endowment that corresponds with that until you're an elder? And that's for those of us that do believe in the endowment process. In the fellowship, you could be ordained an elder tomorrow. You, you know, you the Lord's called you to be an elder. You know, we're going to ordain you an elder, but you're not going to get the elder endowment. 
because you still need to learn all the things it means to be an elder and the responsibilities of being an elder. So yes, as an elder, you have the authority to do the works of a deacon, but you're not called to do that. You can step in and help out, but it's not your place. I have a friend who likes to say, stay in your lane. And so I would say to all the elders out there, stay in your lane. You do not have the authority to act as a deacon unless there is no deacon present. And your role isn't to rule over the deacons. There's there's someone else, there's a, a deacon president that, that helps facilitate, not rules over, but helps facilitate and organize the deaconship. And I think this, this idea of, of, of like a pyramid that we're trying to climb up, I mean, the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't a multi-level marketing scheme. The idea isn't to try to figure out how to get to the top. The idea is how do I help the most people in the best way based on the spiritual gifts that I have and that I have yet to receive? What is the Lord asking me to do? I heard a really, really good message sermon from a brother. He's a deacon in Community of Christ once. And I think he was in his 30s. And he was talking about the fact that as a deacon, he'd been a deacon for a very long time. He didn't feel called to be anything but a deacon. He's never going to be, he doesn't have any need to be a teacher, a priest, an elder, what have you. He's very happy in the role of deacon. It, it fits with his spiritual gifts. Now, coming from, you know, I was raised in the Brighamite perspective. You, you know, if you come on, you're over 18, you're not allowed to be a deacon. That's for little kids. 12 or 13 year olds are deacons. Not adults. Adults, yeah, you can become a priest, but you're going to sit with the elders. You're not going to do any of the priest stuff. So then the question becomes, well, how does that person, if they need to know everything about being a deacon, about being a deacon in case they need to step in for a deacon, how do they learn it? Because they're only with the elders. And so they're, they're using, I'm, I'm kind of mixed. I have mixed feelings here because in one aspect, I love the fact that the Brighamites set things up so that there's this program of growing in the priesthood for their youth. It's a great way to keep people engaged in the gospel. Um, it's unfortunate that it's only for the men, but or the boys, I should say, but it makes sense. Unfortunately, on the flip side, it also teaches them this idea that as they get older, they're going to graduate to the next tier. And so it does become a tier, a, a tier style system. And so there, there's good and there's bad in, in, in their model, just like everybody else's. So, I mean, I really can't complain about that. But what's wrong with someone being called as a deacon? I mean, even in the Salt Lake City Church, when they were first organized, it's not like 12-year-olds were ordained deacons. They had to discuss that for quite some time because they came from their, their branch from Joseph Smith's original church where deacons were grown-ups. They were adults. This was a new concept. And so, you know, they made that change. More power to them. But what happens if a 12-year-old truly is called to be a deacon and they're not called to be a teacher, a priest, or an elder? Are they supposed to be hanging out with 12-year-olds for the rest of their life? And so I think there, there needs to be a better way. And I'm not going to tell them what that better way is or that they need to change. They can keep doing whatever it is they feel the Lord wants them to do. It's, that's, that's not my concern. What is my concern is the perception. Keep that model, if that's what works for you, but how do we change the perception to understand that, yeah, this person may be ordained as an elder, but they're going to be passing sacrament, they're going to be taking care of the church, they're going to be, they're going to be doing the duties of the deacon, because that's what the spiritual gifts are, even though they're ordained as an elder. And I, I don't want, that's the other problem here. We have these divisions. We're going to draw a line here in the sand, and this person is this, and this person is this, but a bishop is the head priest. Right? But he's a high priest. In order to be a high priest, you have to have the Melchizedek or the Magdalene priesthood. So there's this gray, blurred line. There, there isn't this division of, of labor that's just cut and dry. It all bleeds into each other. And this idea that one's higher, one's lower is utterly ridiculous. The Levitical priesthood, if you read Doctrines and Covenants, Doctrines and Saints, it seems very clear to me that the Levitical priesthood is all about organizing people in their congregations. You need to be a high priest, but you're still using the Levitical priesthood. Why? Because the low priesthood is about preparing the earth 
for the heavens to come down. And that is an absolutely mandatory, necessary mission. And it is a top tier. If you're going to build a pyramid scheme, it is a top tier mission. There's nothing higher than preparing the earth for the heavens. Because otherwise, I mean, imagine you're going to, you're going to try to go home, but no one's built a house, right? You're going to park your car. There's no driveway. There's no garage. There has to be the preparation made. And it's not a lesser thing. It's not a lower thing. It's called the lower because the earth is below. And the other is called the higher because the heavens are above. Not because one is greater or more powerful or anything else than the other. So with that, what I, want, what I would like to give to you to think about this week is how can we see the priesthood not as a pyramid and who's on top and how do we grow and, and how do we get more degrees and how do we do this and do that, but how do we see it more as a circle? How do we see it more as a, a group of people that are working together to achieve the goals of God in true Christian service and fellowship? And stop worrying about who's ruling over who. I've said it before and I'll say it again. As the first elder, I don't think that means that I'm the person at the top of a pyramid. I think that means I'm the first person you can come to and you should feel safe to come to when you need help. When you need someone to serve you. Jesus said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so therefore... The deacon would be at the top of that chain if we were going to look at this from a multi-level marketing scheme perspective. As we grow, we're not putting rocks up and climbing a mountain. We're doing the labor of God. We're digging the foundation to build the kingdom of God. And we are all a part of this puzzle. And every piece is equally important. And so we need to stop focusing on who's over who, what's over what, and where the lines of authority are drawn in the sand. And recognize that the reality is that we need to be asking, how do we serve more? How do we serve to a greater capacity? How do we fellowship as one in Christ to ensure that the will of the Lord is done? And if we can do that, then I think we can unite in Christ in a special way. And we can set aside all these petty differences that divide us as communities, as branches of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we can come together to, as Emma said about the Navi Relief Society, do something amazing. So that's my Thursday thought, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.